At this point, the, stay has, the, the, the state has requested an emergency stay of the implementation of the interim maps. In the case of the, the Texas Senate, we got most of what we wanted in the objections that we filed. Originally, in that interim map, there were adjustments to 27 districts. There are now adjustments to five. At the same time, that area in which the court made adjustments in that interim map we feel are not required by the law and, and it should be appealed. And so that stay request will go to uh, Justice Scalia, who sits over the Fifth Circuit, and from there to the Supreme Court if necessary. There will be an appeal in any case. It's a question. The stay essentially stops the implementation of the interim maps pending the, the appeal. And the appeal is over, do we, do we do the maps that we pass and the governor sign or we didn't? That's where we are right now. The, the, the most pressing implication is, is if a stay is granted, it will probably delay the primaries, at least for the legislature, probably until May. The presidential primary will go on in March. If the stay is not granted, the appeal goes forward. Uh, the maps will be implemented that came out of the court and we'll hold elections under those maps and then once the appeal is dealt with if if the state prevails in the appeal then we'll go back and probably in two years we will have elections under the maps that we passed in 2011. do you think it, do you think it's worth it to delay the elections till may if that was to be the outcome it would not is the trade-off worth it it would not necessarily be my preference but it is the process and it's worthwhile I happen to think that adjustments made to the congressional map are, are uh, sort of egregious examples of judicial activism. In, in the court saw things that they liked better, but were they violations of Section 2 of the Voter Rights Act? No, they weren't, in, in my estimation. And I was careful in developing that estimation. I am not a lawyer, and I wasn't here the last time redistricting was done. And so the procedure that we followed was instead of hiring minority and majority counsel for our committee, we went and hired people who would just simply call balls and strikes. An adjunct professor at Texas Law School by the name of Robert Heath, who's probably as experienced a litigator in such issues as there is in the country, and a couple of professors at Baylor University Law School who don't draw maps themselves. All they do is determine whether the law is being violated or not. And my procedure was very simple. Every time that we put an idea on paper or on a map, the question was very clear, is this a violation of law? And if they said, yes it is, or we believe it is, we didn't do it. And, and so nowhere in here did we really rely upon my legal judgment, of which there is none, um, but the most expert judgment. And that's why I'm fairly confident when I talk about judicial overreach. So, so what do you think, so you think the, what was motivating the judges then in, in, I mean, in other words, do you think that reasonable people can disagree about the issues that, that are at stake in the maps? I, yes, I, I think there's reasonable disagreement. Um, not everything in, in law is absolutely clear. There's a matter of interpretation and, and, and people view precedent in different ways. Uh, at the same time, I think there's an almost irresistible sort of, of uh, inclination to overreach and participate where you have the opportunity to participate. What a great opportunity for, for a judge to participate in the legislative process. We see the governor do it in things like the Gardasil issue. There was just pure legislation by the executive branch. And, and, and I understand that inclination. That's why we have courts to which we can appeal that sort of thing. Do you think the legislature is subject to the same overreaching tendency when it comes to the partisan dynamics and drawing the maps? Not so much in the partisan dynamics, but when we talk about the pure composition, do we get to go in and interpret laws and impose that interpretation on someone else? We never do. do does the legislature get to do things like issue executive orders that are simply done by fiat and not through the process? No, we really don't. We don't get to do that sort of thing which is fine. Separation of powers to me is fundamental to our form of government. I think it should be strictly observed. How do you, how do you think the public perceives this? Or when you, when you go, you, we talked beforehand about you've been in a lot of town hall meetings. This is the season for that. Uh, does redistricting come up in the town hall meetings? And when you try to explain redistricting to the constituents, how do you sort that out? I mean, as this, you, know, you get in the weeds pretty quickly, I think. And so I wonder how you, how you do that. Um, 
No, but you generally find this, that, that in issues that are governmental issues that are of interest to the public, they don't necessarily want to dig a lot deeper in large numbers than, than the news and analysis that they see. They're interested. From a person who represents a district in West Texas, I explained a few things and basically told them what was going to happen. Uh, there weren't that many changes in the district that I represent. Um, going forward, if this map is implemented, I will not represent one county of the 26 that I've represented in the past, and I'll represent about uh, 11 or 12 new ones. So it's just a question of going by and saying, I represent you now and I'm proud to do so. And, and if somebody has a question, we talk about it. Um, there's been a certain amount of second guessing. You're talking about separation of powers and different roles in this. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, we, everybody has the, the, the benefit of hindsight, perhaps, right now. Do you think bypassing the Justice Department was a good idea? Um, yeah, and here was the calculation. It, it, it is not bypassing in some sort of sense that, that there's a deception or there's kind of a shifty move. The law offers one a, a two-pronged approach when it comes to preclearance under Section 5. And that is to go to the Justice Department for preclearance or... And, and this kind of shortens the process, go direct to the three-judge panel, and if they don't grant preclearance, it, it immediately is appealed to the Supreme Court. So it is a somewhat um, truncated sort of process, a little bit more efficient in our view. I think the calculation of some people was, we've got a map that's going to be drawn largely by Republicans in Texas. Instead of going to the, uh, the Obama Justice Department, Let's go right to the court system. And I understand that calculation. Uh, one of the things that we found out on the, on the Texas Senate map was that the Justice Department, Obama's or anybody else's, did not find any violations of Section 5 in that map. And, and the only reason that's still in there is because of action of interveners. Um, they would have granted preclearance pre on that right on the spot. So, so there, was, there was some complexity in that. Yeah. I mean... There seems to be complexity in everything in redistricting. Yeah, if you read, if you read the decision, it's, um, I think that becomes pretty manifest. Right. That there's a lot of gray areas in terms of you know, any number of areas in the law. Um, you know, with, so I mean, I, I guess the overall question, with benefit of hindsight, any regrets? Yeah, there's some things that I would have done differently. Uh, we were working on the maps, and this is particularly true with the Texas Senate map. Uh, we didn't do anything with the house map. That's the work of our colleagues across the rotunda, and we didn't mess with it. Uh, we just passed what they sent us. On the Senate map, yeah, I would have done a couple of things a little differently. I would have rolled the map out more than 24, 30 hours before we took it to, uh, to committee so people could have looked at it. It wouldn't have changed anything. But I got caught in a, in a press for time with all the other business that we were doing. And keep in mind, we were waiting toward the end of the session to try and, and get the budget largely done so we didn't get two big, big items mixed up with, with one another. The last thing in the world that, that we wanted was having somebody come along and say, I'll vote for this budget, though I hate it, if you'll do this and this with the district. Didn't want to do that. Thought that was, of all the right. things you could do wrong, that would be the worst. And so we got a little, we got pressed for time there. And I would have spent, I think, a little bit more time with individual members, even though I was available all the time to every member of the Senate to talk about districts. Yeah, that, that, that turned out to be a fairly hectic time as you were trying to put it. Was it was tremendously hectic, and I wish I'd have made a little more time. I could have delayed the, the committee hearing by a day or so. At the same time, because it is always controversial, and there are always elements of partisanship in it, the people who weren't happy weren't going to be happy anyway. But I could have that, that would have been the easiest objection to address, and, and I, wished I'd, I wish I had addressed that. There are some technical things in the map. I could have done this a little differently or that a little differently. Um, but uh, by and large, I think it's a good product, and I think it's a legal product. Um, and, uh, it, and once again, in the Texas Senate map, at a couple of junctures, at several junctures, and maybe final passage, that vote was 29 to 2. With 19 Republicans, it, mean a lot, it means a lot of Democrats voted for it and felt like it was a, it was a fair map, which says a lot about redistricting, because I'm not sure that we have seen that in, uh, in a long, long time. 